I'd like to introduce our speaker. Bill Zucher is a Yale graduate and biblical scholar and also an activist for the separation of church and state. Uh, Bill gives speeches and writes on the subject of religion and how it affects our political system. Um, and he will be talking about the transcendental argument for God. And uh, he has a lot of arguments and evidence in his book, which uh, I read and I highly recommend. It's, it's sort of the best thing on that subject, along with some books by Richard Dawkins. And um, his book is Seen Through Christianity, a Critique of Beliefs and Evidence. And I think you will enjoy Bill's uh, speech. Take it away, Bill. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dave, and, and thank you all for having me here. I see some familiar faces in the, in the group. Um, yeah, the topic is the Transcendental Argument for God, or TAG for short. It's also known as presuppositionalism, and it's uh, becoming increasingly fashionable. Uh, you run into it a lot. Uh, these days. How many people, raise your hands if you've encountered TAG or the presuppositionalism? No? Oh, not too many. Okay. All right. Good. Well, um, this lecture is really an introduction. A lot of the topics that it touches upon are large and controversial, and I don't claim to be an expert on all of them, but I have the basic idea. So let's talk about the three important words. Uh, argument by argument here, we don't mean a shouting match. We mean a a kind of a proof like we all might have done in high school geometry. So a set of statements leading to a conclusion. Transcendental. The word transcendental is a little bit mysterious and it has a lot of meanings, but for our purposes, for this presentation, it basically means something that's necessary for experience. Okay? Uh, specifically something that is necessary for our experience to be intelligible, that is understandable by us us humans. Uh, and finally, what do we mean by the word God? Um, so tag uh, it concerns a monotheistic context. We usually encounter it uh, with respect to Christianity, but it doesn't have to be uh, Christianity. The creator needs to be omniscient because what's happening is uh, the creator, the God, is underwriting all of human knowledge. All right? So tag in a nutshell says that we cannot justify our beliefs that is, we cannot be rational without God. So that's the argument that's being made. Uh, this is an outline of what we're going to talk about. And I have a more detailed outline in paper form, if you could pass those back, just so that you can follow along uh, where we are, because it is, uh, it is a topic with a lot of aspects to it. So I want you to be able to to see where we are in the thinking process. Before we, uh, before we talk about transcendental argument for God, let's just acquaint ourselves with transcendental arguments in general. On a historical note, so the vocabulary and the argumentation approach is attributed to Immanuel Kant. He asked the question, well, what's necessary in order for our experience to be intelligible? As I said before, Intelligible means understandable by us. So in other words, our experience is not a jumble or a kaleidoscope of disjointed perceptions. Uh, it is not, to quote William James, one great blooming buzzing confusion. Right? We can make sense of things. So Kant argued that human minds possess pre-existing categories that we impose on experience. So our minds format the world for us. Space and time are examples. So Kant said that human minds impose space and time on our experience. And these concepts are transcendental because they exist already behind or underneath any conscious thinking or any conscious awareness. Hey, Michelle, come on in. So in simplified form, very bare bones form, this is kind of what a transcendental argument looks like. We start out with something that is meant to be 
rather uncontroversial, some premise y, and then we say x is necessary for y to be true, therefore x must be true. Fairly simple so far. That's the, that's the bare bones form. The content, whoops, if we drop some generic content, we have something like this. We have some experience, some mental experience, uh, and this is meant to be something uncontroversial, like we have knowledge or our use of logic is justifiable. And then the second premise here is some fact about the world that makes that mental experience possible. And therefore, that fact must be the case. All right, so that's transcendental argument. Let's bring God into the picture now, okay? So tag, it's not a single argument. This is one of the things that's a little confusing. It's not just one argument. It's a family of arguments, but they all have a common strategy, which is to challenge the atheist to justify his beliefs. If the atheist cannot do so, then he is being arbitrary, unreasoned, or taking everything on faith. Um, and you know, all of us pride ourselves on being rational. It's irresponsible and perhaps even dangerous to believe any old thing, right? So we have a standard of belief, rational justification. Well, TAG is about challenging the atheist in his application of that standard of belief. So it is a form of apologetic. So traditional theist theistic apologetics, like the cosmological and teleological arguments, they're what's considered evidential apologetics. Transcendental or presuppositional apologetics is different. It focuses on worldviews and makes this really interesting point about the fact that there's really no neutral place to stand when evaluating worldviews. So to clarify, apologetics is an explanation and a defense of a person's beliefs. Usually it's a religious kind of thing, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, worldview, a worldview is a system of basic beliefs about the ultimate nature of things. Everybody has a worldview. Uh, it may be uh, unarticulated or perhaps even unconscious. But this is the really interesting point. Uh, this idea about uh, no neutral place. Presuppositionists, they place a great focus on worldviews, and this idea of uh, the neutrality of evidence uh, is critical. So let me give you an example. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the cosmological argument. So one version of the cosmological argument is, is the first cause argument, right? Things have causes. The causes have causes. The causes of the causes have causes. Well, you can't go on forever, so there must be some uncaused first cause namely God, right? So that's like the first, the first cause article, argument. Presuppositionalists don't like that argument. They're arguing that it concedes to the atheist the concept of causality. It makes the mistake of all those causes I talked about, right? that's causality. Well, what is causality, all right? It makes, the, it makes the mistake of assuming causality is some neutral piece of evidence or some neutral tool independent of worldviews. Presuppositionalists say that evidence doesn't determine the worldview, the worldview determines uh, the evidence. Okay? So presuppositionalists will insist that an atheist is not entitled to the concept of causality because he cannot justify it within his worldview. Okay, so that's kind of the general background. That's kind of where all this stuff is coming from. Let's take a look at how some of these uh, arguments come together, some of, the, some of the specifics. So the first, the first component of a tag is that it assumes that there are only two worldviews, a theistic worldview and an atheistic worldview. And I know atheism is not a worldview, it's just the belief that there are no gods. Um, but it is the case that everyone has a worldview and whether or not a god is in it uh, is rather fundamental. So the theist will say, existence is intentional. God created our minds to be compatible with the world in which we find ourselves. Uh, the atheistic view, existence is happenstance. It's accidental. And our minds are compatible with the world by a process of evolution. Now, uh, there's some, some assumptions. If we look at the theistic worldview, obviously we, well, we have the assumption that there's a God, a God exists. There's also the assumption that the God is omniscient. 
And there's also the assumption that the God intended uh, the world to be intelligible to us. To a, to a Christian, those are relatively modest assertions, right? Because Christianity believes much more. But from a philosophical standpoint, that's quite a set uh, of, of statements that would need to be justified. On the other hand, on the atheistic worldview, um, we have the view that uh, our minds evolved. In other words, that uh, some neural networks at some level of complexity acquire content and become beliefs. Okay, and that's something that the theist is going to, to challenge. Another ingredient for TAG is the definition of knowledge. So what knowledge is is actually controversial. The traditional definition is justified true belief. All right? That implies that the knower can actually demonstrate the truth of a belief. Presuppositionalists uh, like this, uh, this traditional definition. Just to clarify, so justified true belief, and that was the dominant, the dominant view of what knowledge was for about 2,000 years. Okay, justified true belief means that knowledge is a subset of beliefs. Okay, it's those beliefs that are justified and true. And although this is a real hot debate these days in psychology and, uh, and neuroscience and philosophy, uh, presuppositionalists like this because it emphasizes justification. Right? There's a stress again on justification. Uh, the last component uh, that we need to be familiar with is the impossibility of the contradictory. You'll hear this a lot from um, aficionados of TAG. And this is something like, well, either A or not A must be true. It's not not A, therefore it must be A. Uh, this, is, this is also known as a disjunctive syllogism. It's basic basic logic, but of course, I'm sure you can see where this is going. Tags are going to contrast theism and atheism and then claim that atheism fails. Hence, theism is correct. So let's put all that together, all the ingredients. Here we go. Here's our basic tag template. So we have some experience, the necessary conditions for this experience, fill in the blank are found in either theism or atheism. The necessary conditions are not found in atheism. Therefore, the necessary conditions are found in theism. Therefore, God. And you can see what I talked about earlier. This is sort of Kant's question. You start out with an un uncontroversial statement about mental experience. And you conclude that there's some fact about the external world. And in the middle, you have this impossibility of the contradictory or this disjunctive syllogism that says one or the other's uh, got to be the case. Um, all right, so that's the template. You guys are probably champing at the bit to see a uh, to see a real live one. So let's talk about. I want to talk about two examples uh, specifically that are very common. We'll do a knowledge tag and a logic tag. So, so here we go. This is this is the sort of the, the preamble. And and by the way, I'm trying to make this. I'm trying to disentangle this and make it as logical as possible. If you watch the presuppositionalists in debates and uh, in uh, exchanges, it's not anywhere near this orderly. Okay, so this stuff will kind of comes at you in a, uh, like a fire hose. But let's ask this question. The presuppositionalist is putting this question. How can an atheist have knowledge? Right? Our everyday behaviors involve responding to what we assume is an external, that is a, a mind independent world. We perceive this world through our senses, but how do we know we can trust our senses? Right? There's optical illusions, there's errors, dreams, hallucinations, mental illness. How do we know we're not mistaken that we are not subject to these? How do we know that we are not systematically mistaken? Okay, that we're not subject to uh, complete solipsism. Well, so you can see, let's take this skeptical argument now. Right? So that what, what the theist is trying to say is, well, our common sense notions of, uh, of the empirical world are not quite as defensible as we, we might have thought. So now we're going to take this and we're going to slot it into the template. So, oh, ah, we have knowledge. Of course we have knowledge. The necessary conditions for knowledge are found in either theism or atheism. The necessary conditions for knowledge are not found in atheism, as shown on the previous slide. 
Therefore, the necessary conditions for knowledge are found in theism, therefore God. So that's a, that, uh, that's a basic uh, tag. And again, it, it's, it's seldom laid out uh, in this explicit uh, manner. You normally have to sort of uh, pull it out. Um, before we dissect these, let's talk about another one that's probably even more common. Uh, and that's uh, the idea of uh, logic, right? We all use logic. Uh, how do we know that works? How is an atheist's use of logic justified? Well, you can't use logic to justify logic. That's circular. You can't use observation experience. Oh, but it just works, right? Uh, because you need logic in order to draw conclusions from observation experience. Jeepers, this is getting hard. Well, logic can't be a social convention like driving on the left side or the right side of the road, because then it would be different everywhere. We know that's not the case. In fact, logic is assumed to be universal and invariant. So universal means it's true everywhere in the cosmos. Uh, invariant means it never changes. Well, how could finite human minds uh, possibly know this, right? But we use logic all the time, right? And if we don't want to violate our own standard of belief, if we want to call ourselves uh, justified or rational, um, then we must believe that logic is somehow justifiable. So here we go, here's the trap. Our use of logic can be justified. The necessary conditions for justifying logic are found in either theism or atheism. Am I starting to sound repetitive here? All right. The necessary conditions for justifying logic are not found in atheism, for the reasons we just discussed. Therefore, the necessary conditions are found in theism, therefore God. All right. So what's going on here? Um, so a couple of observations, as typically presented, tag is, is a negative argument, right? It's not usually talking about the merits of theism. It's typically focused on the demerits, if you will, uh, of atheism. And the theist will uh, graciously grant uh, that the atheist can know things and can use logic. They just say, well, but he can't justify them. Therefore, the atheist is borrowing from the theist's worldview. And because the atheist cannot provide justification, the alternative, uh, a theism is vindicated by the impossibility uh, of the contradictory. And um, so the external world and our senses and the use of logic are two examples of a broader class of things that I just want to call our attention to. Um, there's a bunch of these things, and, and any of them can be harnessed by a tag. Right, so these are some traditional problems in philosophy. How do we justify these beliefs? We've talked about the first two, logic, the external world and our senses, the uniformity of nature and the truth conduciveness of inductive logic. That's kind of a mouthful. I was worried I wouldn't be able to get that out. Um, the uniformity of nature means that the world behaves consistently. Uh, inductive logic, put crudely, is generalizing uh, from experience, right? So we'll say uh, all copper conducts electricity. Well, how do we know that? Well, from observation, experiment. Have we tested all pieces of copper everywhere in the universe, in the past and in the future, right? So what justifies the leap from observed cases to unobserved cases? Well, we assume that nature is consistent, that it's not gonna change in between the observed cases and the unobserved cases. Um, and of course, uh, in our everyday behavior and in science, we rely on inductive logic and the uniformity of nature. Um, science can't prove the uniformity of nature quite the other way around. Science needs the uniformity of nature, otherwise it wouldn't make sense. You couldn't, there would be no point in doing an experiment if every time you did the experiment the results were different. You couldn't learn anything that way. The existence of causality, right? I mentioned causality uh, earlier. Um, so causality is, is a power of one event to bring about another event, right? But we can't observe causality uh, empirically, right? We just see one event and then we see the second event. We see the, the cue ball move, then we see the eight ball move, and we posit that there's some necessary connection between those two events. 
but of course we can't see necessity, right? So causality is a mental construct uh, that we apply to our experience. Finally, the existence of the past and the reliability of our memory. By the way, there are, there are some other ones. The existence of the past, right? How do we know that the world wasn't created three minutes ago? And we all have these false memories and old sports injuries and, and things like that. Um, that's kind of a classic problem in philosophy. And how would you know your memory was accurate anyway, right? Because you'd have to compare the past with your memory of the past. But in order to do that, you'd have to use your memory for both. So these are difficult. Uh, these are difficult questions, and, and any one of them can be put into harness into a tag. So let's talk a little bit about, well, how would we respond uh, to these things? And uh, I'm going to argue that uh, there are two generic uh, defects in virtually all transcendental arguments for God. Uh, and then uh, we'll get into a little bit more about um, sort of the nature of belief structures and how that's really behind the whole conversation. Um, most tags just have these two problems. Uh, a circularity, because we're making knowledge claims about knowledge claims. And when you think about that, you could kind of make your head hurt. And then secondly, I'm going to argue, I'm going to try to clarify the idea that justification is uh, a challenge common to both worldviews. Let's talk about circularity first. Okay, here's the logic tag again. This is the same argument I just showed you a few minutes back. Right? Our use of logic can be justified. The necessary conditions are in either theism or atheism. They're not in atheism. Therefore, they're in theism. Therefore, our God exists. Right? So the takeaway from this argument is that without God, you can't have logic. But wait a minute. This is a logical argument. Huh? If you need God to justify a log logical argument, then you can't make a logical argument to justify God. The tag uh, is circular. And this is a special kind of circularity. Most of us are familiar with um, logical circularity, which is when literally when the conclusion shows up as a premise in your argument. That's logical circularity. Epistemic circularity, it's actually a thing, I didn't make it up. Epistemic circularity is when your argument depends on the conclusion already being true. And that's what we have here, epistemic circularity. If you need God to justify a logical argument, you can't make a logical argument to justify God. Let's take a look at our knowledge tag. Right? We have knowledge. The necessary conditions are in theism or atheism. They're not in atheism. Therefore, they're in theism. Therefore, God. So again, the takeaway here is that without God, you can't make knowledge claims. Uh-oh. These are knowledge claims. If you need God to justify knowledge claims, then you can't make knowledge claims to justify God. This tag is also circular at an epistemic level. Very interesting. I was very excited. These arguments always bothered me, and I was very excited to discover that there's, there's actually a thing called epistemic circularity. Let's move on to the second problem that these arguments have, um, and that is just sort of the nature of justification in general. It's, it's a hard animal to catch. Um, for the impossibility of the contradictory to be valid, it has to show that one of the alternatives leads to a logical contradiction. We have not seen that so far. If it does not lead to a logical contradiction, it essentially degenerates into an argument from ignorance. Right? You don't know how to justify atheism, therefore theism. It doesn't quite work that way. It turns out that justification is a challenge uh, for both of the worldviews. And I'm going to argue, well, maybe neither worldview can justify knowledge and logic. Uh, or maybe they both can. Uh, we'll, we'll pull the room and hopefully uh, you guys can Help me with that question. So let's think about justifying beliefs. So here we have a chain of beliefs and questions. Now this is known as the, uh, the regress problem. Right? So when asked to justify a belief, we typically refer to some other belief. Hey, Bill, how do you know uh, George Washington was the first president? Well, I read it in the book. <laughs> 
How do you know the book is true? Well, the author is reputable. How do you know the author is reputable? Well, my teacher told me. How do you know you can trust your ears? Well, I know my ears have been reliable in the past. How do you know you're remembering it accurately? Right? We can do this forever, like a six-year-old or a philosopher. Right? <laughs> so the question is, well, how do, we, how do we draw a line under all of that? And you can't say, because I said so, like you can with a six-year-old. Yeah. Right? Um, there are generally um, the two most best-known approaches um, to, uh, uh, to that question, the regress problem, are known as foundationalism and coherentism, right? Foundationalism says the chain terminates in a belief that's justified, but it's not justified by another belief. Coherentism says the chain loops back on itself in a circular manner. Now, that's pretty intriguing. Let's think about this. Um, what kind of belief could you have that's justified, but it's not justified by another belief? Well, I promised you this would come back. These are the same, uh, these are the same, uh, the same slide that I put up earlier. The same traditional problems uh, in philosophy. We can't justify these beliefs because these are the beliefs we use to do justification. I'll say that again. We can't justify these beliefs because these are the beliefs we use to do justification. Holding these beliefs is what we mean when we describe human beings as rational animals. Okay? If someone didn't believe these things, we would be very concerned about his or her safety. Right? And so this stuff, it forms, uh, it forms a package. And this package is held by both, by both worldviews, although in slightly, uh, slightly different ways. So don't try to justify these. Let's take a look at how uh, a foundationalist view of things would capture these ideas. And I'm comparing theism on the left, left and atheism uh, on the right. So foundationalism uh, sees the is a belief structure that starts out with a small number of beliefs that are foundational at ground level and then supporting a much larger number of beliefs in the superstructure up above. So on the theist count we have belief in God and then the rationality package and then George Washington and, and other things. Whereas under atheism, we just have the rationality package and these other beliefs. Now, the theist is going to criticize this. The theist is going to say, well, w without God, this is just an ad hoc hodgepodge of beliefs. It, it, that hodgepodge needs some context. It needs something that unifies it. That unification is God. Without God, this list is arbitrary. The atheist, of course, will respond, well, no, it's not arbitrary, because if it were arbitrary, everyone would have different ones. And actually, everybody has uh, the same ones. Moreover, the atheist will respond, hey, we both have the rationality package. You, Mr. Theist, have this additional superfluous belief in God, right? So the atheist view is more, is more parsimonious. So it seems to me, at least, that uh, either theism or atheism can inhabit this uh, foundationalist belief structure. Uh, let's take a look at the coherentist belief structure. And don't focus on the words right now. I need you to bear with me. Just look at the pretty, the pretty loops um, here. So coherentism is a belief structure that instead of, instead of seeing beliefs as being justified in a linear chain, it's actually like a complex web where every belief is mutually reinforced by every other belief. All right? And um, what's interesting, so if you look at, um, oh, now, obvi obviously my diagram is a huge uh, oversimplification, but it does capture a rather important feature here, namely uh, the inescapability of some level of circularity. If you look at the theistic uh, circle on the left, it's really what we were just talking about in terms of with respect to uh, uh, epistemic circularity. The belief that God created reliable minds justifies the rationality package, those other beliefs. 
But the use of that rationality package is what enables the theist to conclude that God created reliable minds. So again, that, I mean, that is the circularity we essentially we saw earlier. What's really interesting is that um, that predicament is actually shared by the other worldview. They're, they're exactly, exactly parallel. Because under atheism, we have the view that evolution has produced uh, reliable belief-forming mechanisms in our mind. So the belief that reliable minds evolved is what justifies the, real, the rationality package, but that's also circular because use of that very same rationality package is what justifies our belief that our minds evolved. Right? How, can we, you know, how can we rely on rationality? Well, because our, our minds evolved to be reliable. How do you know your minds evolved to be reliable? Well, by using rationality. So um, it seems to me, once again, either worldview can uh, inhabit uh, a coherentist belief structure, um, but both of them are hobbled, it seems to me, by some level of epistemic circularity. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to further challenges. So, so far we've concluded that TAG fails, um, that, uh, that both worldviews are in a similar uh, position with respect to this whole question of knowledge and logic and so on. Let's make things a little bit spicier and talk about a, a more sophisticated version uh, of TAG. If knowledge exists, then the necessary conditions are found in either theism or atheism. The necessary conditions are not found in atheism. Therefore, if knowledge exists, the necessary conditions for it are found in theism. Therefore, if knowledge exists, then God exists. Interesting. It's, uh, it seems much more modest, right? And, and consequently kind of uh, more defensible. It still has defects. Uh, for one thing, uh, it u it's a logical argument. So it uses logic prior to establishing God uh, and hence assumes that logic is justifiable independently of God. And of course also um, premise two here, the necessary conditions for knowledge are not found. Well, that's a knowledge claim. And yet the argument itself declines to assert that knowledge exists or that we have knowledge. Um, so this problem has difficulties as well. But it brings up a huge issue. Do we have knowledge? See, I, I warned you this sort of, it's kind of like it just gets bigger, it's like a conspiracy, it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, if there's a God, why assume he designed us to attain true beliefs? Since evolution selects for behaviors, not the thoughts behind them, why assume it generates true beliefs? Maybe we don't have knowledge at all. Um, I want to dwell a little bit on these first two uh, bullet points because it, it's kind of fun. right? Um, so in the scenario where there's a God, it seems to me, we will have access to just that set of ideas that the God wants us to have access to. No more, no less. How do we know that that's truth? The only way we could know that is if we were already at the same knowledge level as the God in question. So it seems to me that's difficult. Now let's talk about evolution. Uh, and by the way, I'm talking about here about unguided uh, evolution, right? So evolution se uh, selects for behaviors, not beliefs. Right? What matters is functionality, and functionality can be more efficient than truth. There are uh, computer simulations. In fact, uh, Professor Hoffman at UCI here, uh, not far from here, um, has some interesting articles on this, where in multi-generational computer simulations, functionality drives truth to extinction. In other words, the most successful organisms are those that possess simple hacks to survive and reproduce. And they don't waste precious energy on luxuries like a true picture of reality. So maybe, maybe we don't have uh, knowledge. Perhaps all we have are uh, useful fictions. But is that so bad? Um, this is actually, I mean, what I'm talking about is actually a very old view uh, in science. So we often consider science to be uh, one of the crowning achievements of rationality. But when you think back 
most of the, most of the scientific theories that have ever been developed have sub subsequently been demonstrated to be false, right? So think of the four humors. The phlogiston uh, theory of combustion, the, the luminiferous ether. For two centuries, we thought Newtonian uh, mechanics uh, was true. And yet, life went on and babies were born and uh, it was okay. As we, as we stand here today, uh, Sante, as we stand here today, we know that uh, quantum and relativity are in conflict with each other, which means that one or both have to be wrong, at least in part. So, yeah, but life goes on. So, open question, do we have knowledge? I'm going to raise now another open question. We have some unfinished business from earlier. <coughs> what is logic? We addressed earlier the epistemological question. How do we know? How can we justify? And we said, you can't justify logic. You just have to presuppose it. Now, we're asking the ontological question about existence. What is logic? What in the, what in the wi wide west is logic? Um, and these are, these are three of the most common views. You know, you stop and think about it. Well, it's immaterial. And yet it manages to force itself upon uh, our reasoning, our thought process, and, and also on physical states of affairs. That's rather remarkable. How could that be? So, yeah, the three most common views, concepts from God. It's either created by God or an aspect of God's nature. Platonic realism, well, it's just a set of relations that exist in the universe. Uh, or nominalism. Uh, the view that actually logic doesn't exist at all. These are just names that human beings apply to the patterns we encounter. So, obviously your theists are going to be up here. Um, the idea that logic is created by God generally crashes and burns pretty quickly because if you say God created logic, then you can say God could change logic, which means that God could abolish the law of non-contradiction, which is absurd. It means he could exist and not exist. Uh, at the same time. Not to mention it would be unreliable at that point, right, if he could, he could change it. So saying logic is created by God doesn't really work. Saying that logic is an aspect of God's nature uh, is something that uh, you'll hear from more sophisticated uh, apologists. Um, it strikes me as a little bit ad hoc and a little bit vague. Um, all of a sudden now we are asserting that we do possess knowledge on no less a topic than the nature of God which is pretty bo a pretty bold statement, it seems to me. If logic can be an aspect of God's nature, why can't logic be an aspect of the universe's nature? Which brings us to, uh, to realism. Realism as in logic is real. It exists out there independently of any, any minds. It's a set of relations. Um, and obviously this goes way back. Uh, you know, one of the difficulties with this then is you kind of have to uh, take these relations as kind of brute facts. They, they just exist. And it's unclear how uh, a non-physical thing like logic could impose itself uh, or interact with the physical world. Nominalism comes from the Latin name, right? So these are just names that we give to things. Logic doesn't exist at all. It's, it's all in our heads, right? Um, we, we encounter patterns uh, and give them names. So for example, uh, they'll take the law of non-contradiction, right? Some object is either a stone or it's not a stone, clearly. So we abstract that pattern and we give it the name, the law of non-contradiction, right? But that law, it's, it's going to exist whether there are any minds uh, in, in the universe at all, whether there are human minds or divine minds. So that's the idea behind nominalism. Some of the issues then, of course, are well, why is it that these certain patterns always seem to uh, occur, uh, recur uh, consistently. Uh, and how is it that human beings can actually generalize uh, from experience if they don't already possess some innate idea? Uh, how, can, how can humans abstract if they don't already possess some innate idea of what they're abstracting toward? So that gets, in, gets, gets you back to Kant, right, with sort of ideas that are in our minds. So all of these things are enormous topics, um, and I don't pretend to know the answer. Uh, if any of you are uh, planning on 
debating with a presuppositionalist, you definitely want to look into and uh, pick one of these uh, pick one of these stories uh, as an alternative because um, this one will be uh, presented as as the only sensible solution. Okay, so in concluding, right? Tag does not prove the existence of God, but what it does do is it reminds us that all worldviews have difficulties explaining rationality and justifying the beliefs. Most tags, at least the ones I've seen, suffer from epistemic circularity. Both worldviews face similar justification challenges, and either can work with the two belief structures, right? Foundationalism works if we accept presuppositions as, well, foundational. Uh, coherentism works if we accept some level of epistemic circularity uh, as inescapable. Um, but I've kind of, so we started out with this small question, what's TAG? And I'm leaving here today by putting these two enormous questions on the table, so you're, you're welcome. I didn't want to solve everything for you today. <laughs> we have these two, two modest questions, do we have knowledge uh, and, uh, and what is logic? So that's about all, I've, all I've, that's about all the wisdom I can impart this morning. Dave, you want to have a discussion, Q&A? How do you want to proceed from here? Uh, uh, maybe I'll... Uh, this is kind of a small room, and if you speak uh, loudly or if you need the microphone, uh, one question I, I would like to ask is if you, if you substitute scientific evidence for atheism, uh, then then that's a, a whole different set of evidentiary uh, beliefs because you can prove evolution through scientific evidence that one thing led to another and uh, we're essentially uh, related to even very primitive life forms. But you cannot do that with uh, religious a belief in God because there really isn't any concrete evidence for it. How would you uh, assess that? Well, are you asking me or are you asking our hypothetical presuppositionalist? <laughs> I'm asking you. Um, yeah, well, I would agree with that. I mean, if we go back a few slides here, um, right, I showed you four common permutations of belief structures and theism or atheism. Um, I'm kind of here, I, in, full, in full disclosure, I'm kind of kind of here, um, but I'm, I remain open to, I remain open to theism. I don't, I don't know the answer, uh, but my, my gut is here. I think um, the human predicament is such that some level of circularity is inescapable. Um, and so the evidence for evolution is enormous and overwhelming, but that evidence does all depend on all of this, right? Because they say, well, how, show me your evidence. How can you believe your eyesight? How can you believe your ears? So it all gets back to, that's where the presuppositionalist is gonna take the debate. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, some questions here, anybody? Oh, I, I had uh, some difficulty following your lecture because I'm not sure of the definitions of some of the things or examples of them would be. And the one word I was really looking for, a definition of is knowledge. <laughs> oh, that's an easy one. Yes, knowledge. <laughs> what is knowledge? Whoops, did I go past it? Yeah. Yeah. Right, the definition, the definition of knowledge. So if we go back to Plato's Theotitus, I think, was the dialogue where he actually um, defined knowledge, not in quite these words, but justified true belief. I think he said true belief with a logos, with a story, right? So the 2,000-year-old definition of knowledge is justified true belief. What does that mean? Can you hear an example? Well, um, I believe that um, Ronald Reagan was the first president of the United States. Now, that's a belief, but it's a false belief. 
I said, George Washington is the first president of the United States. That's a belief, but that's a true belief. Now, according to this definition, if I can back it up, then I have knowledge. But if I can't back it up, I don't have knowledge. I just have mere opinion, as Plato would say. And that, that definition lasted until 1963, when a guy named Edward Gettier wrote a three-page article in a philosophical journal entitled, Is Knowledge Justified True Belief? And in the last 50 years, there's been this explosion of debate among philosophers, cognitive psychologists, and, and neuroscientists on what knowledge is. And so, I'm sorry, I can't answer you. I can't give you an answer to the question other than, um, you know, an intuitive one. You could be, uh, have a true belief, but just be misinformed. Well, like the sun, the sun goes around the earth. Well, that would be a false belief, right? It would be a false belief, but you could truly believe it. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Which, and that raises a really interesting question because a lot of times people start talking about, well, what they're certain of. How certain of you? How certain are you of this? And certainty is completely irrelevant because certainty is a psychological report. Right? It has nothing to do with uh, truth uh, or falsity. But, and Dave, you, you raise an interesting question. So, one of the, the issues that Edward Gettier raised was you can be right for the wrong reason. So if you look at a clock on the, on, on the wall and the clock says it's 9.30 and it actually is 9.30 and you hold the belief that it's 9.30, it's, it's a belief, it's true, and it's justified because you looked at the clock, right? But what if unknown to you, the clock broke three weeks ago and it just happened to break at 9.30. <laughs> so you're, you're right for the wrong reason. And that's, that was what got this whole snowball going about what is really the true definition of knowledge. It's a, it's a huge yeah. issue. Or it could be attributable to going to daylight saving time. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me there's a missing word here, and that's absolute knowledge. Um, I mean, well, look, who's going to disagree that we have knowledge of certain things, maybe that it's 90% justified? Uh, like you say, that Washington was the first president. I mean, are we really going to spend endless hours in philosophical journals arguing about that? However, if we say that it's absolute knowledge, then you get into that tangle. But is it, it's... Yeah, so I think what you're getting at is the issue of, of fallibilism. So again, the traditional view was that in order to be knowledge, it had to be infallible, right? And again, it, since, since the 60s, um, most philosophers have, have, have embraced fallibilism, which says you can still call it knowledge even though, even though there's a possibility that it's incorrect. That's what science says. Sure. Okay, anybody else? Uh, I wanted to ask, um, so if a presuppositionalist uh, were to say, um, let's say we have a uh, sort of a fundamentalist view of the uh, world, sorry, foundationalist view of the world, where we have certain basic assumptions, um, the atheist would, might say, okay, we've got these seven basic assumptions about the uniformity of nature and, and all these uh, other things that you showed in the rationality package. Whereas a presuppositionalist would, would say, well, we just have God. We just have the one assumption here, and then God can inform all those other things. Therefore, actually, my worldview is more parsimonious. My worldview is simpler and better justified. How would you respond? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can't compare worldviews. <laughs> no, it's, it's um, what's, more, what's parsimonious is sometimes in the eye of the beholder, right? Because, like I said, from, from the atheist standpoint, they're both assuming the rationality package. You, Mr. Theist, are adding on this unnecessary um, suitcase, right? I've got, these, I've got these beliefs. You want to put the beliefs in a nice Samsonite suitcase. I don't need the suitcase that you're, call, that you're calling God. So is, is the suitcase just one thing? But if you open it up, it's got seven more in it. Is that more parsimonious than just the seven things? Yeah, so it's again, it's subject to interpretation and debate. Um, can you 
briefly describe your belief about the separation of church and state? Because I noticed in the news they have a, a congressional candidate that's having a prayer breakfast. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, this is nothing too complicated. I, I'm a very strong believer that church and state need to be as far apart uh, as possible. And um, we consistently see people um, who kind of don't get the message and are kind of uh, backsliding. And, and a lot of the boosterism, the, the sort of the, the pro-God boosterism, is a vestige of, of the, the 1950s and the Cold War when the national slogan was adopted and uh, the God stuff was put on our coins and currency. That did, or in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance, that stuff didn't exist before the 1950s. So, yeah, I, I just find it appalling uh, that other people seek to use the, uh, the coercive machinery of the, set, of the state uh, to impose their views on others. Mm -hmm. thank, you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you again.